Bob Nagy here for RBR Cycles in State College, Pennsylvania. Today we're going to assemble a JC70 and a JC26X sort of at the same time in the same video. The 26X has the suspension, the 70 does not, but this is also applicable to many different track models. Also, if you're not super comfortable with hand tools or you don't have no experience assembling bicycles, don't feel bad about going down to your local bike shop with your new performer trike in the box and you're going, could you assemble this for me? Next, I will show a table of contents to the video. So hit the pause button right after this and you could look at the table of contents in case you want to jump to a particular section in the video. Let's get you on the road. So the first piece you're going to pull out will be this, probably, and it is the boom. Using box cutter here, very careful not to uh, mess anything up. But the boom is going to have the derailleur on the other end. Let me go ahead and cut down here. Be careful because you can hit, you know, you can hit parts in there. You don't want to wear it up. And of course, this has the front crank set on it, and look at that beautiful black boom that is a large diameter I had uh, Rob send me a rear view mirror gotta have one of those set all your stuff sort of in an area where you can look at it and get it together here's the 700 millimeter back wheel there we go and on top of it is uh, the fender back rack, which is really a nice accessory to get included at, at this price. A nice quality. Looks like these are shipping with uh, Michelin Protec wheels right now, or tires that is. This big bag over here is the molded seat. There we go. And as uh, Rob said, uh, he had suggested they go to a, a thicker, thicker padding. Looks like these are all shipping with a thicker padding now. Wow, very interesting. It has a uh, peel-away Velcro attachment to this molded seat. This seems to be, oh, this is, this is like fiberglass material. Wow, it's really high-tech. Very nice. Now, the entire front assembly with the wheels is one piece. The wheels and tires, the whole, the whole assembly here is one piece, all pre-assembled here. So this comes out all at one, all at, with, at one pull. And here's the uh, front plastic fenders. Some sort of strut offset thing here, which we'll show you later in closer detail. Very lightweight. Very lightweight. And then the main frame. <laughs> and I got it in uh, yellow. I don't think any which of it. Oh, there we go. It's showing over there. That's nice. It's sort of a uh, wow. It's a pearlized yellow. Very nice. So it has a super gloss like a metal flake, very fine grain metal flake in the color. Very nice. The uh, chain tubes are mounted and taped right to the side of this. And then in the, in the bottom here is JC70 yellow. The box of all the rest of the hardware and different parts of the derailleur and everything else. And we have looks like the uh, crossbar in the front for adjustment and uh, steering. Cable housings are in the very bottom here. And that's everything in the box. So here's everything we got out of the box here so far. In total. And this is the parts box that comes at the bottom of the large box. First thing you're going to open up and see is the assembly instructions, which are available as well online. And the remainder of the parts in here. Here's the uh, headrest. That's a really nice thing to have, too, because it really aids in comfort on the seat. Now, I see some people don't mount it. I'm, I'm definitely going to mount it. This little foam padded thingy over there, very nice. Now, I open this up. There's two extra front tire tubes in here. Wow, how nice of them. They're all, you know, this is the two front ones. 
that's awfully nice of them. Uh, front derailleur. Oh no, this is the rear derailleur. Sorry, rear derailleur. There we go. Ah, they pedals, and they come with, uh, you know, the regular sneaker style clip-on things there, and, and as well, the other side would be for your clipless. So they do suggest clipless because your feet can fall out. Get the cables over here. A roll of foam with reflective uh, white stuff on the back over here. Maybe about 10 feet of that. Um, got some reflectors for inside of the wheels. Very nice. Your tool set. Wow, your chain brake over here. They give you a complete Allen key tool in there. That's great. And an opened end wrench. How about this? Touch up paint. How nice. Wow, that's terrific. I mean, that's really lifetime supply should you need it. Some extra bolts, zip ties for tidying things up, especially guiding the chain along there. And uh, oh, look at this. This chain is huge, huge and silver. It's probably got some lube on it right now, but boy, I would uh, I would definitely could put some high-grade lube on this. And when we, we break the chain with that tool, we'll put it back together with the, uh, the one link that can actually be broken. Little guides and stuff here. Also the front axle with the two springs. There we go. We'll be doing that pretty much right off when we start to assemble the bike. All right, let's make this bike. Now be extremely careful cutting off the foam when you're using a blade of any type because you do not want to nick this gorgeous paint job on here. So be very ginger about doing that. Taking all your, cutting all your tape points. I just made the blade stick out like an eighth of an inch so I can't possibly nick this stuff. In any place you, any place you can take it off by hand, do it. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous paint job. And, and also, because the uh, tube is, the main tube is so big, it really shows off the, uh, the color of the paint. Check out that gorgeous paint job on there. Like I said, it's sort of a metal flake yellow in this case. Looks a little greener than it does on the video than it does in real life. Very nice. And of course, I've laid it on there using the uh, foam I cut off just so the frame doesn't have to touch the ground. Now the front assembly is referred to as the outrigger. And again, very gingerly take off the tape, taped foam here so you don't nick the paint job. Now the four bolts that you're going to use to assemble the two pieces of the frame are already screwed in to the wheel assembly, the front wheel assembly, and not in your parts kit. When you're assembling the two first pieces of the frame, the first thing you do the whole front assembly is a bit unwieldy because it doesn't have the stabilizer bar, you know, the calibrated bar between them, the steering bar, and these wheels just sort of want to go every, every different direction. I leaned the back of this tube on the seat in the back so that it wouldn't be touching the ground for a little, little foam under it here too, so none of the paint job is going to touch the ground. And then um, I just sort of gingerly put, well, I like that word, don't I? Put the uh, main tube onto the front uh, wheel assembly and hand tighten the screws in. These, these, these bolts come out with the uh, provided Allen key set and they're already preset in, in this, this assembly, the front wheel assembly, so you pull them out and put them in by hand, feel them as they go in. The aluminum tubing on this is very light so it's very easy to work with but it sort of wants a wonky wonk all around so just take these down hand tight and then the biggest biggest one in here, and this also includes a Phillips uh, screwdriver and a regular screwdriver, take them down gently so they feel like they're centering down. Some people might suggest using Loctite thread locker on here. I don't because you're going to have to sort of finely adjust the seating and the, and the alignment and really you wouldn't, you can't just screw them in once and that's it. There's a little bit of fine, fine tuning to be done. So also these are very much oversized. I don't see any reason that they're going to come loose on you. And of course you can, uh, you could check them periodically. So I'm just going to take them sort of very slight finger tight with this so that, so that the two pieces are mated. As of March 2017, the uh, JC70 is shipping with the Michelin Protex City tire, and it's a pretty darn nice tire, nice and grippy, nice uh, patterns on it. Uh, mine had a little bit of air still in them. They come with a press to valve, and be sure that you uh, tighten it in case that little screw at the top is not all the way down. Tighten that up, and of course you loosen the top of the press to get your pump on, and uh, the pressure range on this is 57 to 87 PSI, or 58 to 87, putting the median uh, inflation right around mid-70s, so 73, 75 pounds, something like that. And of course, uh, lower gives you a softer ride, uh, and a little less efficiency, more friction, a little harder to pedal maybe, slightly, and higher pressure 
well, you're gonna have a lot easier time pedaling, but maybe a little less grip on the road and a little harder ride. When I'm talking about the left or right of the bike, I'll be referring to the driver's left or right. So if I was sitting in there, this would be the right side of the bike. The next thing we're gonna do is install the 700 millimeter wheel in the back. And the um, cassette itself, the gear cassettes, gonna go on the right side. And as well, the uh, quick release is gonna go on the left side. So we're gonna insert from the left side by taking this little nut cap off and then come this way and this little nut will go on the side with the gear cassette on it and this on the left side of the rear of the bike. So to install our rear wheel, we're just gonna lift the bike up. First thing we do though is take that nut off of the end and one of the first spring and they are set up to go wide end of the spring out towards narrow towards the bike frame. I'll set those that little nut and spring aside and my little axle and I will take the two plastic caps off of the 700 millimeter wheel. Both of them have plastic caps on the end to protect the uh, thread, so pull those off. And this is where you have to be careful here because we're going to set this right onto the bike frame. Carefully lift it up, slide the wheel in. You'll see that they go right into position into the two slots in the frame. The rear wheel on the JC26X, JC20, and all other bikes is going to slip in in the same manner. You'll feel that the, the wheel fits right in between here, and it's very tight. I mean, the, the tolerances are very tight on this, so now we're going to take our little axle here that I've taken the nut off and one of the springs off and left the other side with the one spring on it. Not quite focusing, but you can see it. And I'm just going to insert it through the axle of the bike. And again, the spring goes narrow side in to the bike and the wide side out towards the tightening nut. And you'll, you know, as you can tell from the other side, one way when you push the lever it's tight and the other way it's not. The technique is you turn the plastic nut on the opposite side until you feel resistance about halfway through this arm's travel. And that's about right, and then it will lock down nicely. Yeah. One of the tips I don't tell you in the manual is if you're going to use the rear fender on these bikes, it is best to mount it before you put the rear wheel on, because one of the mounting points is actually right here behind the wheel. And this thing is really very hard to get to if you have the wheel in place. So uh, myself, I like just using the rear fender and not the fronts, but you really should put that on first. When you do put on your rear fender, if you're using it, you'll have to adjust it as it goes around the wheel because this plastic is quite pliable. Now on the front here, the set screw is, is pretty much fixed, but then you've got two struts here which do not have adjusters at the top. And look inside so that you can see the wheel clearance here and you can see that if you need to, you can sort of just bend them by hand slightly so that the clearance is good right here. And after that, to get the rear ones, you've got to loosen up these little strut adjuster nuts over here and you can literally slip these up and down and get your fit exactly right. So just give them all a little half turn so you can adjust them and then look at this. It's quite pliable and you can move it up and down so that it just does a nice clearance on that tire all the way back and then cinch them down. It's a good time to take a look at the bike from the back and see that the wheels look parallel, everything looks straight and true. Now the way that the alignment can be done is, looking at the two front wheel assemblies, if these on the bottom are tilted to the right compared to the bottom of the back wheel, then you would tighten the two left bolts on the outrigger to frame assembly point at the front. If they were tilted to the left as compared to the rear wheel assembly, then you would tighten the two right bolts on the outrigger to frame tightening point at the front. Once you got it aligned, then go ahead and alternately tighten them down all the way. Next thing we're going to do is put the derailleur, rear derailleur on, and of course you have to get it out of your little parts box and figure out which way does this thing mount on the bike. Well, the little arm on the bottom is going to spring out, and the writing is going to be towards the outside where you could see it, and a little th threaded uh, screw back there and there's a threaded hole on the body of the bike. There is a little set screw on the back where the mounting hole is, and that's to adjust the exact derailleur position at the end, which we'll do when we have the chain on and, and sort of get the right position then. But this little threaded screw, which is the only thing you can see on there that would fit into this hole, is where it mounts on the bike. 
So take that rear derailleur, put up the threaded screw right into that hole, and then take your Allen key set here that comes with it, and feel for it catching the, um, the threads. You know, it takes a little jockeying around, and all of a sudden you'll feel it catch, and it's very easy to turn. Pull the derailleur back enough that that little set screw does not get in the way, and then take it on home. You'll feel the set screw stop its movement at that point, and you can let the set screw up against there and go ahead and take it on home, and pretty darn tight. Now we're going to attach the steering rod, which connects the two front wheels together so that they're exactly parallel and steering together. It's sort of a U-shape on both of these bikes, and we're going to be adjusting it, measuring from the back of the two front wheels to the front of the two front wheels, sort of what I call the 9 and 3 o'clock positions. Now the best way to do this adjustment is going to be just to take one of these out, and I would suggest the driver's right side. We're going to take it out adjust it in or out so that we can get those spacings correct and lock the nut back down. And something that's not mentioned in the manual, which I would suggest, is to be sure that your tires are inflated uh, at least to 50 pounds each so that there's no sag on them and they're sitting the same way on the ground while you're doing your alignment. Now, on the uh, 26X, they send this little calibration rod, you could call it. I mean, it's a pretty serious piece of equipment for a measuring stick, but it is simply a metal tube with an Allen screw in the middle, and you can loosen that and slip it in and out and make it longer and shorter. What it is for is measuring between the front and back. So you measure exactly at the same spot. I would call it the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock position if you were looking at this wheel as a clock. So right in the middle of the front, right in the middle of the back because you're looking at that front to back measurement and you would adjust this and then bring it to the other side and see if it's exactly the same length. And you would adjust the nut on the connecting rod until they were the same length. You don't need the abject, you know, it's 29.32 inches or whatever, but you need the exact same length. So measure on the same spot inside of the rim at the 3 o'clock position and at the 9 o'clock position and keep adjusting that tie rod until you get it right. Now the thing is, on the tie rod, you can just turn it a half a turn at a time because it's got to be straight up. So you can't turn it a quarter turn, so it's, it's, that's the increments of the turn you can make on this thing. And that means that at some point you're going to have to decide to make it perfectly equal or slightly less than equal. So in other words, the front might be a little less uh, distance between it than the back. And this is what's preferred. It's called toe-in. What this means is when a person sits on this bicycle, because of the geometry of the frame and the way it's put together, the wheels in the front will tend to splay out a little bit at the bottom. And that means that your adjustment with nobody sitting on it, if you're doing this by yourself, should be a little bit toe-in in the front. That means that you're going to extend one or both of these sides uh, slightly, because this connects in the back, and the wheels are going to slightly cant in in the front on both sides, just the slightest detectable bit, such that when you do sit on it, those wheels are in perfect alignment. Or if anything, a little bit toe in, because you can imagine if the wheels were set wider in the front and you're going down the road, it would, would not be a good thing. So if anything, you want this rod a hair too long in the back, so that when you sit down, it splays out a little bit, and it's still a little bit toe in in the front. So when you're using the calibration tool, I'm going to call it alignment tool, provided in the JC26X and some others, you can loosen up the set screw and then just tighten it by hand when you get your measurement. So I go to the back first over here, over the frame, I'm going to do it in what I call the 9 o'clock position on the inside of the rim. I'm going to go ahead and tighten it up with finger tighten it and then move it to what I'm calling the 3 o'clock position. I'm going to do this under the frame since the frame is going as elevating as it goes forward. And I can see that I'm about a half inch off or too wide in the front. So I'm going to need to extend my connection rod in the, underneath the frame over here. Now when you're doing your toe-in calibration and taking the one side off where the brake assembly is on the bottom because it's easier to get to, um, you don't have to tighten the lock nut on this bolt all the way in and you know every time you do your measurement. Go ahead and just get it where you've got a little bit of toe in on the front and then cinch it all down, lock your lock nut on this back and then do another measurement to be sure you've just got a little bit of toe in. It's a little narrower in the front than the back. And next we're going to install the pedal set. These are rather nice. Uh, they've got a clip, you know, bicycle shoe style clip on one side and then your regular toe clip on the other end when you're just wearing sneakers or something like that. But they're manufactured quite nice and they are marked right and left, uh, actually right on the stem of the, uh, right here. 
and the stem bolt up there. But of course, when you look at it, they can only possibly go onto the uh, boom set here in one direction, the front, front crank set. Uh, so, you know, so that your feet could go into them, it's only going to make sense with them mounting in one one way. They do suggest uh, putting a little bit of grease on them, and I've got a little bit of silicone grease. I'll just dab a, a little bit on the threads before I tighten them in there. The pedals actually come with the actual cleats that go onto your shoes that mount into these pedals. Nice. You have a little bit of silicone grease on the threads, and of course you can all do this by hand. Uh, nicely, the little logos on here are covered with a plastic protector because you can scratch this stuff up when you're just assembling it. And just be very gentle about how you turn it until you feel the threads start to thread in there. These are quite fine threads. Nice crank set. Now you think putting the pedals on might be the easiest part of this whole thing, but it's not because the pedal is moving independently of the screw that you're trying to put into the into the pedal. They do thread the normal way. In other words, clockwise you'd think on the right pedal and it does that way. So because it's it's spinning, you can't really just use the pedal turning it around to get it into the hole. You got to use your fingers at the bottom to aid in getting it down there. And then when you get it down there, you can use an open end or a thin crescent wrench, or the one that's provided uh, with the set. Now remember, when you're putting in the left pedal, it threads counterclockwise in. So it's going to throw you off trying to catch the uh, threads when you first put it in there turning it clockwise. So that's why it might, you know, might be a, you might say a few expletives at this point. But there we go, thread it in and take her down and tighten it. Next, we're going to mount the seat. And the seat mounting bolts are already in the frame where they're going to attach. So we're going to take these out with the second largest Allen key that's in the provided set. And they're just barely snug, so you can just break them and then screw them out and go ahead and take the uh, washer with them. And they do explicitly say that it's very important to have these tightened down correctly. So I'm going to suggest Loctite thread locker putting these in so that we know that they're snug and that they're going to stay snug. On the back mount of the seat, right here, the back seat mount, you can see that there's two mounting holes for the mounting bolt here, and there's a slide area here, meaning that you have an adjustability. You can adjust this up and down, level and backwards and forward a little bit, so there's a little bit of adjustability in the seat. Let's take a look at the front bracket. On the front bracket, uh, we can just loosen this up, these mounting bolts, and this, this can be slid the rock backwards and forwards to conform to the seat's mounting position. So we do have a little bit of variability. We're going to loosen mo both the front and the back bottom mounting bolt there. And so we can customize the fit to the seat. I know I like to be a little bit more up. So if you put this in a higher bolt to hole here, that would bring the seat down lower. It's on the highest position uh, from the factory. That's where I'm going to leave mine. So when you're first installing, I would go ahead and loosen the rear mount main bolt up a little bit so we have a little bit of play in this backwards and forwards very slight and don't loosen the front up it's got the two screws in it there leave that there and then customize the fit with this back one here and if you do also use some Loctite remember that Loctite and plastic do not get along this is fiberglass but still there's a component of plastic in it and I'm going to use the very tiniest bit on the last two threads very tiniest bit and when you push it through, don't touch the, the uh, plastic or the fiberglass seat. But they're very explicit about having these very, very tight so that they don't come loose and start to damage the, uh, the seat itself. So again, I don't want them to come loose. I'm going to use a very slight bit of Loctite on them and gingerly put them through the holes. Because uh, I've learned the hard way that if you use Loctite on plastic threads of any kind, it it just ex explodes, the explodes the plastic. It's just, just gone. <laughs> so, Go ahead and tighten the front ones. Well, fairly snug, but that you can still adjust the seat a little bit. So just to where they're just feel, you can hitting, just hitting the bottom on them so that they'll let the seat slip around a little bit while you adjust the top. And then with that top mounting bracket bolt loose through the frame of the bike, jockey that little back mounting plate right in back of the hole so you can see it and then go ahead and put your screws in and take those down to 
fairly snug. There you go. What it's going to do is it's going to move that back bracket right into the position it wants to be in. And so that everything's happy. And then you can sequentially tighten the back and the front down to pretty darn tight, I'm going to call it. Remember not to over tighten because you are tightening against the fiberglass of the seat and you don't want to crack it. And that Loctite will hold these screws in position once you get them where you want them to be. It's sort of like a cyanoacrylate. It will definitely hold them in position. And then go ahead underneath on the top mounting bracket and tighten up that nut right there at the base. On the 26X, you'll notice that the front mounting point is the same as on the JC70 and 20, but the rear mounting point over here has a different sort of assembly to it. And it's just sort of a, uh, I guess you could call it newer model. It gives you quite a bit of variability in the exact positioning because you can slide it back and forth, you can slide it up and down, and get that back of the seat position where you like it. It also has a quick release axle style locker on it. So you'll want to loosen these up on both sides over here, loosen the quick release and put the uh, seat in with the two mounting bolts and then go ahead and move it around to where you want it and tighten the two top ones and lock the quick release. Next thing is to insert our boom assembly that has our crank set on it and pedals into the main frame. Now as shipped they put a little spacer insert into the main tube here to protect it and it is locked in place by these set screws so we have to loosen these up with the, the biggest allen key on here and pull out that little uh, insert to put our boom in. And we'll loosen them up from the other side and pull the spacer out. So, very carefully, because we have beautiful paint jobs on here, insert the boom assembly into the main tube. This is when our beautiful trike starts to look like something here. And we're just going to sort of put this in a general position because we're going to adjust it later. I'm not going to tighten it real tight, just tight enough to hold this in position because we're probably going to move it and I don't want to mess up the paint on the black tube or anything, so just, there we go, snug enough to hold it. Now the seat cushion sits right into this framework, and on the back you've got these Velcro pads already pre-installed. You just pull off one side of the glue and lay it right into the seat here. Now on both these models, they provide a neck rest. This doesn't rest on the back of your head because I would hit the helmet, but it rests on your neck, and you just insert it into these two little cinch holders here, adjust it to where you like it, you get a little bit of forward and back mo movement and height movement, and then cinch it down. The next thing we're going to be doing is putting in our cabling. That's for the gears and the brakes. Now you have two little bundles of cables here. The ones with the big ends on them are your brake cables, and the ones with the little ends on them, little nubbins on them, are your gear cables. So two and two. Now on the brake cables with these bigger ball ends, the, the cables are exactly the same length. And on the ones with the short nubbins on the end, your gear cables, the longer one's going to go to the rear derailleur and the shorter one to the front derailleur. Now this is where you're going to be glad you looked at the video. This is not described in the manual. Here are the six pieces of cable covers that are, you're going to use in the assembly of the brakes and the gears. Two long ones, two medium ones, and a shorty. Now the two long ones are going to be used for your gears and one of the long ones and one of the very short ones are going to be used for the rear derailleur. The two of the same size on the left are both for the brakes. Now this very short piece here is going to be just a little extender that goes into the brazon. These are called brazons, these little pieces on the frame, onto the rear derailleur. And there's this, just a little cup for it over here that it goes into. And it does fit perfectly in there. And that way it can move around and keep the cable in the correct position. And then there's going to be a space here to the next end cap brazon, which is where we start one of the long cables and route it under the seat. You'll see that under the seat is one of the little hold uh, type of brazons, just a, a guide that's under there. And it, you come up to the back one here, this is actually where one of the end of the long cables goes, and it's fed through this other one. So you have to feed it through the one under the seat first and up to the back. On the 26X, the cable for the rear gears are going through that brace on underneath the seat. I routed it underneath the rack, strut there black, and then there's a brace on on the single suspension arm coming back and back to the back gears, the cable being exposed at this point, and then the rear cable sheath going here. So go ahead and take one of your long cable guides and feed it through that first one. 
up to the back one and let it sit into the back hole. The cable that goes to this guide will actually be um, out in open air between this and the little shorty in the back. So now that you've got your uh, piece of long cable housing routed through that little open eyelet and back into the brazon in the back, you take the long gear cable, which is going to have that small nub on the back, the longer one of the two, and route it through the cable here. Um, the open end of it is going to be at the back of the bike and attached to the derailleur in back, and then they're going to put a little cap on the wire and crimp it down to keep it from fraying. So we feed it from the front, and when it comes out of the hole in the back, we'll feed it between the little piece guide in the back and the front one, which I'll show you. Here's a little tip. When you're going to feed your cables through the cable sheaths, do not pre-trim the ends. Don't try to clip off the cable because you know it's going to be a lot shorter because you will never get the clean factory end that is on these pre-made cables and you will have a very difficult time pushing it through the sheath. So feed the entire piece of cable through first and trim it once you've got it out the other end. I also do suggest a little silicone grease on this. I mean, these are high quality stainless cables. Nothing's going to happen to them. That said, uh, easier movement is easier movement, so why not put a little, just a touch of silicone grease on them. Now the latest JC70s are shipping with these bar end shifters called Micro Shift. And you have to insert the cable into it with the ball end first from through the shifter and then put your, your cable end up into this little cup that's underneath of it over here and feed it from the front all the way through the big cable jacket along the frame brazons towards the back derailleur. So that's we'll start feeding it from the front. That wants to pop out on you. Just feed it into the hole in the cable guide and go ahead and push it through. When you are feeding the cable through from the top of the ball end over here, push the lever all the way to the forward position towards the front of the bike. That will release um, the tension in the in the cable and it will align itself with the position that the rear derailleur is in when it's in its installed position there. So it will pop out as you're pushing it through from the front and just, just push it on, push it on through here. And as I'm pushing it, it will pop out over here <laughs> on the top here. And at that point you really can grab it from here, feed it into the other inlet and then let it guide all the way through. And when it pops through, it'll come out the, the bottom in the back of the derailleur over here. There we go, it pops out over here. And you can just pull it on through. Now, if you did put a little silicone on the, uh, on the guide wire, when it's touching the ground and flopping around, be sure that you move any, pull any dirt off of it because it will tend to collect a little uh, dust and stuff if you put a little bit of grease onto it. And then go ahead and pull this all the way through. You can just pull it snug from the back. On the rear, rear derail, you'll see that it comes out right here, and that this here is a locking assembly to get the cable to stay in position. And this little stay is what grabs the cable right here, that little lip under there. So we sort of feed the cable right through that, and that's sort of the, the pinch point for the cable. Be sure there's no kink in the cable. You do not want to kink the cable, so very gentle. Like so. We're not going to tighten it yet. We're going to get to adjusting the gears in a little bit. On the 26X's rear derailleur, the position of the cable lockdown screw is slightly different. So do it as this picture shows. Now you can pre-adjust the rear derailleur uh, such that without the chain on it, you're going to get it pretty darn close. So you don't have to adjust it once you've got the chain on it, which is more difficult. And these two set screws over here, one and two, are going to set the range limits of travel of this rear derailleur. And so the inner one over here is going to set the inner position here as this gear, this is the one, the inner wheel closest to the cassette is going to determine where the chain lands on this. You're going to want to line that little uh, wheel up there with the smallest gear on the cassette. And you can see right in this alignment right here, that's what I'm talking about. And you just put your Phillips screwdriver in over here and turn it and you can see it's changing the position slightly. Just try to get it as lined up as well as you can. And then with your hand, push it into the other side and you can see that that little wheel is going to line up with the largest gear on the cassette and you want to adjust the other screw over here, the 
lower set screw so that it lines up as best as you can with that large gear on the cassette. And they seem to interact slightly, so just go back and forth a few times until you get them pretty much right. So the resulting routing for the shifter for the rear derailleur is going to be right here, coming out the bottom to the left side, and then down towards the coupling bar. We're going to zip tie that up down there and clean it up. And on the other side, it is also on the inside. Because what we're going to do is pull this up against the grip and then use the foam tape over it and just cover the cable completely up. It'll go along, get zip tied down to the cross tie bar, and then dressed up to the front, to the front derailleur. The front derailleur's guide, cable guide, comes under the bar here and it's zip tied onto the connector, front steering connector, outrigger connector, it comes through a braze on underneath, put the whole cable shield right through this braze on, follows it up, and then comes up to the top here in this little uh, braze on, which is the one that holds the cap at the end of the cable cover. At that point, we're going to be connecting the cable up to its control point on the back of the front derailleur. Now, when you're putting your cables into the brakes on the front, there are, of course, cable covers or sheaths that go over the cables, and you have a lot of choices as to where to route your cables to make them most elegant and efficient. Of course, for the brakes, depending on whether your calipers are mounted in the front or the rear, uh, you've got a cup at both ends, and, and you have a, a cable cover with uh, two ends on it. So you're putting them into the cups, and you are routing them in the most elegant way that you can so that they have the least kinks in them, and they are going to operate most cleanly and not be in the way. So depending on the different models you've got, they may send you sheaths that are longer than you need. But what they do send you, which is sort of fun, is that they send you the means to make the cable covers exactly the size you need. Because of course the cables themselves are extra long to begin with. So you just take a tape measure, some cutters, and they give you this nice little bag of cable sheath cover ends in black or silver and you can just cut them to exactly the length that you need to make them the most efficient and elegant. When you do trim down your cable sheath to size, if you'll end up doing that, one thing that's very important is when you trim the ends, be sure that you trim off any metal burrs that might go towards the center of the cable housing that might scratch on the cable itself. You want to be sure you nibble off so you have a nice clean end on the metal end of this cable sheath. Now when you pull the brake lever up to get the cable started, you'll notice there's a little place to put the ball and there's a little cutout where you can get the cable in so that it slides into the hole. And at that point, you can then go ahead and take your cable and feed it down through the um, bottom part of the brake lever and into your cable housing. And as I feed it down in there, have the adjusters down here all the way tightened in towards the bodies because you're, as the cable stretches, you're going to want to unscrew those and tighten the cable back up with the fine adjusters over here. So go ahead and, and loosen those and tighten them all the way to the body of the lever and then start feeding your cable through into your cable housing and route it along its way. Now because the lever wants to self-return, it's sort of a three-handed operation doing this, but uh, well, a little tricky, but not so bad. Keep pushing the cable forward until it pops out the other end of the cable, uh, the cable guide down there at the brake system. And then straighten out the ball so it's facing down and let it go into the uh, housing. The brakes have the same type of cable stay at the end where you cinch the wire down with a little nub in there. It's going to come out of the end of the cable protector and put it through there and use your Allen wrench set to tighten it up. And uh, then we'll start adjusting. When you loosen up this little nut down here and feed the cable through, you then want to be sure that your cable guard tube ends are into the sockets at both ends, at the lever and right here, that they're actually sitting down in there before you pull the cable taut and then use your tool, your Allen wrench, to uh, cinch it back down. And you can just tighten it where it's fairly snug to get an initial feel for it, so not super tight, fairly tight and then press the brake lever and see if it stops midway. In other words, the brake lever stops midway to hitting the metal on the, on, the, on the handle grip. And that should certainly be a really good place to be because you want your brakes to engage when you're oh, about pulling them about halfway down. If you're happy with it, you can go ahead and tighten it down even more. The ends will be cut off. You can cut them with diagonal cutters 
and then uh, stick those little metal end caps, the smallest little end cap in a little plastic bag, and you can crush it over that cut off end so it doesn't fray out later. Now the idea when you're setting your gear cables and brake cables initially is to pull all of the cables snug and be sure that the little booties of these little protectors, these little cable protectors are snug and in their position so that there's no slack in the system. And so you just pull them snug and then go ahead and cinch them down and we can, we can fine tune from there. But that's your initial position before you start adjusting any of the real fine adjustments. Now the next thing that we're going to do is and we, this is an option, is to adjust the handlebars. And they come pre-adjusted from the factory, really, with about three and a half inch clearance right over here between the tire and the uh, bar itself. But you can sit in your seat at this point and see where your arms naturally go out to in a neutral position. And that way you can gauge if the pre-setting from the factory is going to work for you. Of course, you want it to just be comfortable when you're sitting there, not, I mean, say, wheels going forward. And then go ahead and turn it both ways, and you're going to see that you do need to have it out enough so that when you're going to make a right or a left turn, that you're not hitting your, your body or your knees uh, when you're making that left or right turn. So you do need the clearance. So it is important to have it out somewhat towards the tire a bit. And these little plastic caps pop right off of here, and you use the Allen wrench provided, and you just loosen this, and you can position the uh, steering wheel or steering bar right where you'd like to have it. And of course they should both be the same. I found that coming from the factory it really was just perfect for me. And these little caps come out of here very easily with your fingernail. I might even fall out of there later. On the JC26X and some other models, the hand grips are actually separate pieces that slide into the struts coming off of the steering mechanism. So you can adjust the verticality of them as well as the position uh, close to the wheel or not. So just loosen the uh, Allen screw on this little collar, slide it in. We are not going to do uh, perfect adjustments right now. And then take your Allen key set and go ahead and center down. We'll do a fine adjustments once you're sitting in the bike. When you're adjusting the handlebars, remember you're not loosening this screw up here. You're going to unloosen these two, loosen these two, and loosen this one. And then, of course, sit in it and adjust your thing. I'd make them slightly snug so it sort of holds position, get it right where you like it, and then cinch these two and that one down tight. Now adjusting the boom length is going to happen with you sitting in the trike itself. Really, that's the exact position you're going to be in. So, sit in the trike and with your leg straight out and foot vertical, have it so that when, you're, when your foot is vertical and all the way out, it's touching the pedal nice and flat against it, and that should be pretty much the position you're going to want to put it at and cinch it down with the Allen wrench on the two bolts. Once you've got your leg length with the pedal all the way in this far position of the crank, then take a look at the crank and it has to be perpendicular to the ground. It's really level and that's pretty easy to see because your eyes will really tell you if it's off at all. And then we're going to cinch the two nuts on the side. And if you'd like, and if you have one, you can certainly use a level and put it alongside the crank set and see that it is actually perpendicular to the ground. Use that biggest Allen key in the set and go ahead and cinch it down. They don't give a, a foot-pound rating on these, so you have to sort of guess at it. You get it tight and then turn the t tool to the right and just give it another half turn, something like that. If this is not tight, you will find out really quickly the entire thing will spin on you. And as you tighten them, the other one becomes loose and back and forth a few times, so you'll feel them tighten up until they're both almost exactly the same tightness. Again, tool turn to the right and give it a little bit more back and forth until you, you feel equal tightness. As I call it, PDT, pretty darn tight. Now in your parts box, you're going to find that you got a little Ziploc bag of these little well, you could call them ferrules or whatever, and I was wondering what they were for because they're not referred to in the manual. These first ones, the very small ones, are when you put your cables into the cable covers to your brakes and gears, you're going to have extra past the end, several inches extra. Cut it off with a couple inches, maybe an inch past the end, and slip this little cover on and take some pliers and crimp them so that it covers the little frayed end of the wire and let, doesn't let it fray. These others are actually made to go on the end of your cable covers, but the cable covers that were, were shipped here with this uh, already had ends on them. So if you find that you have some cable covers that have plastic ends, a two of mine had metal and two of mine had plastic, and they provide you with the extra metal caps, just go ahead and pull off the the plastic in 
and insert one of the metal covers that fits. And that'll sort of give you a little bit of upgrade to the uh, cable cover. When you're routing the cable housing for the rear derailleur underneath the bike, put the cable housing either on the outside of these two chain tubes or in the middle, not in back of it, because you do never want it to touch the rolling chain guide that's back here or get in the way of the chain. And we're going to zip tie it. I have mine in the center. I'm going to zip tie it to the outer tube so that it is well clear of any action with the rolling chain guide wheel. Even if you're pulling taut on the cable to get all the slack out of the cable while you're tightening on the uh, restraint there, you're not going to get all the slack out. And thus, your micro shifter on the front is not going to be aligning these perfectly with the gears on the cassette. So this little micro adjuster over here is what you're going to use to take out a little slack in the system and get that first gear and last gear lined up. So I'm going to tighten it up till I feel just a little bit of pull there. There we go. And that may be right, but this is what you're going to adjust to make sure that it covers the whole range of travel in the click, uh, clicks of the micro shifter up front. Now, when we're pre-adjusting the front derailleur and the shifter is on the left handlebar, that shifter, that micro shifter, is not a detent shifter. So what we're doing is just going over the range of travel and being sure we can get from the left all the way to the right on these three gear sprockets. Now, it looks like the one on the left is overshooting a little bit. I'd like to get it right lined up. So these two adjustment screws here do the travel. The one on the right is for the extent of travel right. The one on the left on the extent of travel on the left. So I would just go, oh, okay, let's take it in a little bit. And that's a little bit better. Let's go all the way to the other side. Looks like we're overshooting just a hair on that one. So I'm going to back it up to the right position and then I'm going to adjust the screw until I see it just starting to push in a little bit. You start to move a little bit there. Be sure we have our complete range of travel. That looks PDG, pretty darn good. Now it's time for fun because we're going to take the chain and route it through the chain tubes and the gears of the unit. Now, when you take the chain out, you're going to notice a little bag with it, and this bag is the master link. So this chain is not a complete circle now, but when we get it to the right length, we're going to actually remove the part of it that we don't need and add the master link to recombine the chain back together. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and put the chain um, on the smallest sprocket of the front crank set and through the derailleur and into the upper tube. Knowing which one of the upper tube is, well, that's the one that goes through the little idler wheel down there, and it is longer. So that's the one we're going to come through and feed it all the way through the little idler wheel, back through the second chain tube, around the um, cassette in the back, and through the derailleur, and back up through the return tube to the front. And then we'll talk about sizing it. So here we go with the chain. To keep my chain clean while I was feeding it through the tubes, I just found an old box, cardboard box, and I put it in there, and then start from the front. As you pull it, it'll come out of the cardboard box and stay clean doesn't matter which end of the chain I start with. And be sure your chain doesn't pick up a bunch of dirt underneath. Be sure you're working in a fairly clean space. And get your chain sort of untwangled, unseparated. You'll see how it sort of folds on itself a little bit. You find a free end of it, and you're going to start feeding it uh, through the assembly. So that is, again, counterclockwise and back towards the back. We start at the front. There is no upside or downside on the chain, so it's, you can't really get messed up. But through the front derailleur like this is where you've got to go. So you're feeding it through here, feed it through, and eventually we're going to rest it on the, on the smallest sprocket in that front crank set up here. So I could sort of rest it there now and sort of use that as my feeder. It might be easier if you have two people, but I'm going to take that upper tube over here and start to feed it through, I'll move it back a little bit, and start to feed the chain through. First thing it's going to hit down there is it's going to hit that idler wheel. And we're going to feed it through the little idler wheel, and the idler wheel has a little bit of a, a protector on it on the bottom, which you'll see when you get down there. I'll feed some down here until I feed uh, enough to get to the idler wheel. So you're going to see the chain popping out. You can see the chain popping out of that first tube, and you want to feed it through the little protector and the idler wheel like that, because it's a little gear set, and then feed it into the back half section that's in the back here and keep feeding it through. So this goes all the way to the back cassette and derailleur. You can just roll it like this. Just go ahead and roll it along. Pull it from your front. Go up and maybe free a little bit more chain. Because you might be on that small front derailleur wheel. Sometimes the weight of the pedal will want to pull the chain back, but 
just sort of slowly push it through. And once it comes out the back of the uh, tube in the back, you can of course pull it from there and then start wrapping it around the rear cassette. So feeding through that upper tube, eventually your chain is going to come out of the back of it. And you're going to wrap it around the cassette gear set at the back. Notice where I'm positioning this tube. It's up and over the top. You want the path of least resistance, and this is the most direct path. So I pull the chain through here. As our front crank set is moving. We're going to want to pull as much as we need through here so that there's oh, a foot or so on the front end past the front crank set. And we can then loop it through the uh, smallest um, of the gears on the top of the back cassette, as we call it, this thing, the smallest of the gear, and then we're going to take it through the back derailleur. Now, once you've got it over that smallest of the sprockets on the uh, cassette, You're going to go ahead and loop it around the first gear up here, but then you have to take the absolute end of the chain set and be sure that you have, it's, you know, it's not kinked, it's straight. And feed it through the second gear, the second idler wheel there, because there is a protector on it. So you're going through the center of the derailleur and through the little guard over here and then back around. You pull the whole extra chain that you've got through it, and you'll notice that it just sits right on that little idler wheel in the first first wheel in the derailleur just perfectly, and goes right to the second one. And then we're going to go feed it back up to the front. Now I want you to just take a look at this as a note. When you're routing the chain, you can see that the smallest gear on the cassette there is right up close next to the bike. Because the derailleur has not been adjusted yet, its limits of travel, wherever it's sitting once you put the cable through and just adjusted it primarily, may not be right in line with that lowest gear. Mine was actually a few, whoop, a few up. So basically, wherever it lines up with the derailleur, go ahead and put it on the rear derailleur so it's a nice and even line at that point, and later we'll adjust the extent of travel of the derailleur so it covers all of the gears. So I'll go ahead and be sure my chain is not kinked. And on now the other tube, I'm going to feed it back up to the front. And this one's real easy because you're just pushing it right into the tube. You know, pushing a chain, well, that sort of sounds pretty crazy. It does want to fold up on you, but it does go in there and push pretty darn easily. And then when it comes out the front, we will measure it, break it, and reconnect it. Now, because they don't know the size of the rider, they give you a little extra length on this upper chain cover. And once you get your boom length set up for yourself, you can do this before you put the chain on, cut this front upper tube about a half inch shy of the front derailleur guide so that it is completely clear of this mechanism. And the chain will come out right here and go onto the gears. And it will, of course, change a little bit as the guide moves in and out. But you want to be sure it's about a half an inch shy of this front derailleur guide. Just cut it with a craft knife. Let's talk a little bit about what the master link is and how it's going to work. Since our chain's already not a complete circle, we're not actually breaking it with the tool, we are going to take a, a couple links out and then rejoin it with this master link. And this is really keen because it's two pieces that fit together when you put them together from opposite directions. They form a link. So I'm just going to sort of put these together and you can see that it sort of forms a link itself. What's nice about this is you put it together a little bit too close like that and you pull the chain apart and it's going to snap into place. We really don't need a tool for putting this back together. As we pull it apart, it click, snaps back together. You see the hole is a little bit larger on one end, and they slide against each other by pulling the chain from both sides, and click, it's going to snap it together. When you're adjusting this, and to get the correct length of the chain, you're going to want to pull the chain forward on the rear derailleur from the front until it shows that it's just clearing the bottom Okay, and this means when you're on the sm smallest sprocket, when you pull it forward, it's just going to clear. This is not super critical, but you want to be sure that you are clearing down there. A little bit more is not terrible because it'll still make it to the large gear on the cassette. But be sure that it's well clear, right, right about there. And that's going to give you the number of links you need to take out of your chain. 
So once you've got your chain fed through in all the races that it's got to go through and you're coming on around the smallest sprocket on the front, you pull from the rear until you see that rear derailleur pulling free and in clear. When you find it just perfectly clear when you're on the small sprocket on the front and the smallest on the rear, you can say, ah, the, the link, the amount of chain I've got to get rid of is right about that much. So you'll be, you'll be ready to use your chain tool to pull off this much. When you pull from the back chain and you pull that rear derailleur clear so that it can run freely while you're on that smallest sprocket in the back and pull the front chain to it, you're going to find that it matches up at a certain point on the chain. It's not super critical, but it does need to clear it right there. So at that point, you're going to go, okay, right about there is where I've got to break this chain and mark it so that you know which, one, which link it is. And that's the amount of chain you're going to have to take off from the full length of the chain. So now you're made sure that you're on the smallest sprocket on the front crank set and you're on the smallest one on the rear gear, the tallest gear, the smallest of the cassette in the back, and you found the link that you want to break out. Remember that using the master link that they sent, you're actually adding the link back in. So be sure you pull it tight enough that that rear derailleur is really free and clear in the tallest gear, because you will be giving it another half inch back. And boy, when you're in that position, even a half inch can make quite a bit of difference. So pick the right link. So when you're ready to break that link out, make sure that you put it in the lower groove over here, the lower guide, and then when you put it in there, you can adjust the rear nut so that it brings it up taut against it, so it's actually working against something when you press, when you start cranking around this side. And when you do crank around this side, you will all of a sudden feel a little pop initially as it pushes out the, it'll give a lot of resistance as it pushes the pin out of position, and you can take it all the way out to the other side, which will leave you with a sort of female end on this end, and the other end of the chain will also be a female end at that, at that point. Unscrew it and pull it out and you'll see that you've come free, you've come apart. If the link itself is not pushed all the way out, you can run it through again and just push it out the other side. And what you want to come out with is what I call female, two female sides, so that our double master link pieces can go in from both sides and create a link between these two. So you're going to sort of alternate between the male and female chain link members. You want to land up with two of the female sides here. So what we now do is put one of the female, the new master link pieces on one side and one on the other side. And that allows us to put it, snap it right over the protrusion of the, of the little rod going through there. They fit together like so. And then just pull apart to actually make the link. And once you've got the, the two uh, rods going through, so when inserting these on both sides of the chain, you push the two female ends together, almost touching, and then you can push these two master link pieces in from opposite sides, and then pull it apart, and it will snap into position. You really don't even use the chain brake to put it back together. And there's your chain, it's together. Now both brake cables and Gear cables are a lot longer than are required to get to do the job, and that's pretty much normal. So you'd be cutting like you know a foot off the end over here. You want to use some diagonal cutters, and that little bag of stuff that came with it over here has got the little caps in that you put over the end of the cables. We're going to do that right now. Go ahead and leave a little bit of extra on it. I mean, you don't want it to bang into stuff, but leaving you know three to four inches is okay by me. A lot of people take them really short, but um, because what's going to happen over time is that cables are not going to get shorter. If anything, they stretch and you have to re-pull it tight. So it's not as though if you chop it off, it's going to become too short. It's going to continue to stretch a little bit over the course of its useful life. And remember, you do have the adjusters back here, which are fine adjustments uh, as far as pulling the tautness of the cable afterwards. So normally you start with these all the way in and pull it taut and then go from there. So I'm going to leave eh, this much. Chop it off and take your little white ferrule here and put it over the end. And then you can use uh, pliers or whatever you want to use. I happen to have uh, some my favorite duckbill pliers over here. I put it on, put it at the bottom, squeeze it, 
And that way, it's not going to fray or do anything, so you're ready to rock. And do that on all four ends of your cables. Here's something that can be frustrating, but it doesn't need to be. When you are trimming your cables after you put them into the brakes or the gearing, the ends may not remain all tidy and tightly wrapped. And the little caps that they give you in a little bag to put over the end and crimp to uh, just, you know, keep it from fraying, may not be able to be slipped over the end. So don't worry about that. Just take a little bit of five minute epoxy, dab it on the end, and that'll keep the cable from fraying. Now there's a blue sheet of sort of interesting stuff in the package of nuts and bolts and parts, and you just have to look at it for a while and you figure out what it is. It is a uh, protectors, clear protector pads, little oval ones, sort of TV screen shaped, and a long one here that you could use for protecting the finish against abrasion from cable housings moving back and forth across the finish of the bike, because they will as you steer, some of the cable housings are moving around. Any place where it looks like you might have an abrasion from a uh, cable housing, even the chain covers themselves on the main uh, part of the tube or someplace, you can cut a piece of this and put it under there and protect it from ever marring the finish. So that's one of the last things you'll want to do with your bike, you know, when we're done doing everything else. And uh, it just sort of makes sense. It's a really nice little touch. All right, so now let's talk about getting our hand grip set up on the handlebars. Because in March of 2017 and probably after this, uh, Rob is getting these with the end shifters, uh, bar end shifters here. Um, the cable from these coming out of their housing is going underneath the place that we're going to be gripping the handlebars. And that's actually just fine because your hand makes a little notch right there and that's where the cable is going to be. So once the tape is wrapped around it, it's going to feel totally natural. But the first thing you do need to do is the space from the end to the part that holds the brake lever here, the clamp, needs to be adjusted for your size hand so that you've got enough space to grip there and that's just set up from the factory to generic who knows how long. So there is a little Allen key over here that you can use your provided tool with, loosen it up and then take it down or up to where you need it. As I'm getting the fit on this I'm just keeping the bottom a little bit loose here, gripping it while I'm sitting into the bike's seat in the operating position and reaching right out. Does it feel right where it should be? Because you can slip it in or out. And is there enough space for your hand to grip where the foam tape will be without hitting anything? Feels good to me. So make it absolutely ideal for you. You get it? Since that little Allen screw down. So to apply this nice roll of sticky back foam tape for your grips onto the grips, the uh, stuff on the back is where the glue is, so you're going to have to peel it back. And you don't know really how many inches you're going to need to make a grip. So you've got plenty of extra, so don't go and cut a piece to begin with. Just leave it attached to the roll. Go ahead and peel it back and start to roll it down from the top. And um, it really doesn't matter how much you stagger it as you go down or whatever, because there's plenty to work with. I would start with the brake on the back. Feel that cable in the position in the front. I have this cable coming from the bar end shifter on the inside of the brake lever. And take it once around with the sticky stuff off and then start slowly moving it down under a little bit of pressure as you go, about like so, until you get to the bottom. You'll have to move the roll around with you because you got the whole roll with you, but you'll use the right amount of tape. Separating the uh, sticky back cover from the glue itself is a little tricky, so I would suggest using maybe a blade or something like that. Uh, as soon as you get it started, then you're, you're good for the whole trip. Now once you get to this point, you actually can take this bike for a spin after a few different little things to check out. A lot of this mounting hardware on here is going to be loose, so you might want to just cinch it down with your fingers where we're going to mount the rack later. Be sure that while you're in that smallest sprocket in the back and the smallest one in the front that you are clear here, Okay, the derailleur chain is clear right there. You've got to be darn sure that your quick release in the back on the axle is the appropriate tightness. And that means when you loosen it up, it should start binding just over the halfway point. If it doesn't, go ahead to the other side and tighten up the nut on the other side too. It starts binding about right here and then locks down nicely. And that it feels like the wheel is all the way down into, into the uh, lug set here. On your valve stems here, be sure that these nuts are all the way down and tight against the rim, okay? And there are different inflations from the front to the back tire. The back one has got a range of 58 to uh, 78, or 87, 58 to say 87. So that puts it right around in the mid 70s, 73, 75 pounds. And of course, less inflation will give you a smoother ride, more inflation will give you less friction and a faster bike. So that's your choice. Now your front tires, if you're getting the Michelin Cities, 
which it says on there, gives a range of uh, 58 to 73 max. So you want to put it right in the middle of there. Again, be sure that these little, look at that, mine was not screwed down. These little nuts are tight on these Presta valves. From the factory, with the shift levers all the way down, the, um, you'll see that the front derailleur, the chain's coming just about through the center of it, which looks really good. So that means in its resting position with the lever all the way down, which would be your lowest gear, the chain should be sitting right in the middle, as it is. So we can fine tune that later, but that's a really good starting point. My hand grip accessory looks like so. And I've added a little mirror on the outside there with the strap around the base. Shifters in the bottom position to start out with. And your adjusters on the brakes are all the way screwed in. And when you pull the lever, you should feel that it catches about halfway. Good starting point on both of, both of them. Check them. Now we're ready to actually test the bike on the street and see if it works. The fenders and back rack, although provided, are actually optional. You want to take it for a spin and check it out. Once you've checked all the little nuts and bolts and everything are tight, no reason not to. On bikes that have suspension, like the JC26X, you'll see that this shock mounted in the back of the seat in this case has about an inch of a travel in the piston right there, but it's about an inch or so. And the spring is what adjusts the amount of compression versus the weight of the rider. So you'll want to adjust the spring collar at the top such that when you're sitting in it, it compresses about halfway down or about a half inch into it. That way you'll have a half inch travel going down and a half inch travel going up. You'll see when I'm sitting in it, I get out of it and then sit in it, I get that compression. You want to have travel up and down. So this way, if you set it right in the middle, you'll have the most play going up and down. Now, one way to set up the rear derailleur distance of travel is once you've got the bike ready to go and you're doing your test ride, go ahead and bring it out and put it on a toolbox. That's what I'm using over here. Such that the back wheel is lifted off the ground and you can freely turn the front crank set and the back wheel will turn freely. Bring the right hand gear shift lever, the micro shifter, on the right all the way to the down position. Now when adjusting for the most outward highest tallest gear position you're going to be adjusting this screw over here and it's an interplay with the cable length. Of course you have a little micro adjuster here, a cable tension adjuster, a length adjuster. It's going to be sort of an interplay be being sure that you have enough cable length to let this go all the way into this position over here and that the limit of travel is set with this screw such that it doesn't go any further. So we're going to adjust this, adjust this screw and I hope we get it on this last cog over here and uh, that would be when the micro shifter is in the very downward position. Turning counterclockwise allows the derailleur to go more towards the outside. And as you turn the crankset in the front, you'll look for it getting out to that outermost gear. If you find that you are not getting to the outermost tallest gear by turning this counterclockwise and uh, with your cable adjuster all the way clockwise, I mean seated position, then your cable is not quite long enough and you're going to have to adjust the retainer down here to give you a little bit more cable so that it can reach the most outermost point. Turning that crank set, you hope that it'll go on to that last gear. When it does go on to the last gear, then go ahead and turn that inner set screw until you just see it turn it clockwise, until you just see it start to move inwards. You don't want it to move inwards, you want it to be perfectly aligned. So right when it starts to move inwards, the ever slightest bit, back it off so you're right before the point at which it starts to move inwards. Each click of the micro shifter may not exactly land on a gear, but you want a pretty nice action. And you want to be sure you get to the end and it's not grinding, making any grinding sounds and adjusting your limit of travel. You can see visually that the chain guides, the roller wheels, are lining up with the cassette sprockets. And when you get to your most inner one, you want to be sure you're not going to have this travel set so that the chain pops off and goes into the spokes. That's pretty darn critical. And there you go. You're going to be working those three things against each other. This really, really, really nice rack. I say absolutely use it. Gives your bike a lot more utility. But uh, there are a couple of struts here, which I believe look like they're maybe aluminum or not, which go into the front little mounting holes over here. 
so that the uh, bike attachments can happen up at the front because you know this is not a standard bike so anyway these little set screws that are in here um, you can't get at them with the regular tool that was provided so you're gonna have to come up with a right angle there we go right angle Allen key of the same size that fits this hole so luckily I had one there and so that you can get inside at that angle and get in there and, and tighten these up so I would put them in there and go ahead and tighten them up just a little bit to get started before you mount this on the bike now take a look at where these are mounted because it's going to be a little confusing the rack is mounted on the outside of the body struts here and the fender is mounted on the inside on these mounting nuts uh, the rack itself when you first get it you'll actually have to pull apart the struts on this rack a little bit to fit to the outside they, they're, they're welded such that they don't look like they fit until you pull them apart a little bit and screw them down I would suggest a little bit of Loctite there and all of this would be tremendously easier if this wheel assembly was not in here but of course that's your option I'll mark it on the video where to jump back in case before you put this wheel on in the very beginning if you were wanting to hook this rack on you actually could the problem here being that it's very difficult to get to this inner screw right over here this one you can get to with your right-handed allen wrench because you can go through the spokes but coming up against the cassette here you can't even fit a right-handed one unless you got a super shorty so I had to use this a uh, needle nose pliers and tighten it with a little bit of Loctite on it when I take the wheel out I will cinch it a little bit tighter so again with the fender you're just jockeying it into position and loosening these nuts on the front and back of the fender just with your eyeball positioning it right over the tire making it look nice and even and then tightening down these little lock nuts these four little lock nuts the rack is very much self-explanatory as to how to mount it on here but you need to keep these screws loose up on top these four for the diagonal bracers and pretty much the bottom mounts as well until you jockey it into position and of course you're going for level and that would be you know the goal here and you can get that level by just sliding this back and forth so the rods can be tightened about just with a more about a half inch extending through the hole on these bottom mounts and then the ends of course screw in through their single hole loosen the top and adjust it for level you know your eyes are going to be enough to be exact on this um, but I'm going with the fender on the back, no fenders on the front. Why? Because I don't want water or debris kicked up on the back of my head. And it sort of looks better for me in the front without the fenders. But that's your, that's your personal style call. And of course, if you do go through water, that's a whole other story. I'm not going to be driving in water here. So once you get it level, you can cinch all of the screws down, tighten them down. And I have no problem with the ones going into the frame on both the fender and the rack to have a little drop of Loctite on them just to hold them in position and then cinch everything down. Putting a cycle computer on a recumbent or a tricycle is always a little bit of a challenge because you don't have that horizontal bar there but I found a great way to do it right here because you're pretty darn close to the sitting position the uh, this little cycle computer went right onto, onto the arm over here the steering arm and the strut for mounting the fender I'm not using the front fenders you probably can do this even with the fenders on is perfect for mounting the sensor right next to it so super short distance you could use wired if you wanted uh, you'd have a lot of extra wire <laughs> distance is only about four inches but there you go really slick little mount so there you have it the assembly of the performer jc 26 x and jc 70 recumbent trikes and it was a long video so thanks for sticking in there i hope this helped you get on the road until next time take care